Today in Matt's class, we are going over the format of writing a screenplay. I'm excited you guys are hanging out with me today. We've got James behind the camera as per usual. Also hanging out with me today is Cam Turner and we are going to talk about the format that you are going to use to write your screenplay. So there is screenplay writing software that you can use and some people might say well then why don't I just use the screenplay software. You still need to understand how it works and why it works because it's not going to write the screenplay for you and sometimes it'll do a really cool job of placing things in its own format how it's supposed to be but it doesn't always get all of that right. You kind of need to know how it works and then yes yeah, screenplay writing software can work amazing but what I'm going to show you today will work if you've got screenplay writing software or if you just have any program like Microsoft Word or Pages or any word processing program like WordPerfect whatever it is that you're using this is going to work just fine I'm going to show you exactly how the format works. First up the font that you want to use is called Courier. It's basically a typewritten looking font. It almost looks like a typewriter. So almost any font that kind of has that look will do. If you have any kind of word processing software, it probably has Courier in it. If you don't see Courier under C, look up N a little bit further down the list because a lot of times they have what's called New Courier. So this is the font and the size, the point size is 12. Now, next up, you want to make sure your format is set to single spacing. Some people might look at a screenplay and they might say, well, wait a minute, there's spaces all over the place. Isn't that double spaced? It's not. There is a fair amount of spacing all over, but you want to control where that is manually. So here's what's up. When you are writing a screenplay, everything begins with a scene. So whether you're writing the beginning of your screenplay or whether you're not sure what the beginning is and you want to start somewhere in the middle, everything is broken up into scenes and every scene begins with what's called a slug line. So I'm going to just write some basic notes here. All the notes I'm going to give you today, I'm going to use a red marker and then the actual script that I'm writing, I'm going to use a black marker. Your slug line is always all capital letters. So here we go. When you are writing your slug line, there's four pieces of information you always need to have in this order. Number one, does this scene take place inside or outside? If you're inside, it's INT. If you're outside, it's EXT. So let's say we're gonna have a little story that takes place in my classroom, which is basically my living room. But before that, we wanna have an establishing shot so that people kind of understand where they are. So first, we're gonna have an establishing shot outside. So that is gonna be EXT, all capital letters space dash space where are we so we've got four things we need first is interior or exterior second is where are we just universally in general so we are at matt's house space dash space where are we specifically we know we're outside we know we're at matt's house but there's still a lot of places we could be we could be on the roof we could be in the driveway, we could be in the backyard, we could be in the koi pond. Where are we specifically? So again, first is inside or outside. Second is where are we just universally. Third is specifically where are we? Well, this is just gonna be an establishing shot, so we'll just say driveway, space dash space. There's one more thing that we need to know and it's essentially what time of day it is. And you can mark this down by usually just saying day or night. It usually doesn't have to be anything specific. You could say something like sunset or dawn or dusk or something like that. But usually you don't have to say anything specific like early afternoon or early morning because as soon as you're filming outside, the audience never really knows. So for example, you might have a scene that takes place at 1030 in the morning but they might film it at 4.30 in the afternoon. No one would ever watch that movie and say, wait a minute, this is supposed to be 10.30 in the morning. Uh, the way the light is coming down through the trees in this time of year, this would totally be like 4.30 in the afternoon. No one would ever know that. 
They just know watching a movie, is it daytime out or is it nighttime out? And that's very helpful for filming as well, not to get too specific. So we're just gonna say day. After that, what you do, you hit the return key or the enter key, but you're gonna to wanna to hit it twice because first it's gonna bring you right here, but you need to have a space. So you're gonna hit the return key again, and that's gonna put a space between the slug line and what comes next is called descriptive text. Sometimes people call this action. Sometimes people call this general. I call it descriptive text. That makes the most sense to me. So this is the most like, if you've ever done any kind of creative writing or any prose style fiction, this is the closest to that because you're writing in paragraph form without indentations and you're basically breaking up your paragraphs like beats as they call them. Every time something new happens, that would be a new paragraph. So this is just an establishing shot. So we might have beyond a Japanese maple tree, comma, an eclectic ranch looms in the distance. A young woman walking her dog passes by letting you know it's just kind of like a this might be an eclectic house but it's kind of a normal subdivision now if this is all you see this is all we have for this scene it's just an establishing shot before we come inside again you're only writing about what you see and what you hear we could talk about do you hear birds chirping you know in the trees or can you hear distant traffic off of Heidenrich Road or something like that but is that really important to the story? It's not. So like useless things like that. I almost contemplated not having a young woman walking her dog passes by. I almost didn't write that down, but I wanted to show that this is not in the middle of the wilderness somewhere. I wanted it to be a normal subdivision. So I threw it in there, but I didn't describe what she's wearing because it's not really important to the story. I didn't even describe what kind of dog it is because it's not important to the story. All right, automatically after we have our descriptive text, we have a space. After that, we have a new scene that takes place inside this room. So that begins with a slug line. So now uh, we've got these four pieces of information. First of all, are we inside or outside? Well, now we're inside. So inside is interior. So we write down capital I-N-T space dash space. Where are we? Universally, we are at Matt's house. Space dash space. Where are we? Well, this is my makeshift classroom right now, but this is my living room. All capital letters. By the way, when you've got your descriptive text up here, this uh, general or action, this is standard lowercase. All right, so here we are with the slug line, living room, space, dash, space. We've got one more thing that we need to say, is this daytime or nighttime? This is actually daytime, and it's kind of important because you would be able to see through the windows whether it's daytime or nighttime. So here we go, all capital letters, and then we hit the return key. There we go, there is our slug line, space, dash, space. So what do we see? What is happening? A dashing young man, comma, Matt, all capital letters, is writing notes on a dry erase marker board. A dashing young man, Matt, is writing notes on a dry erase marker board. He turns to see Cam 
looking at him with a goofy expression. A dashing young man, Matt, is writing notes on a dry erase marker board. He turns to see Cam looking at him with a goofy expression. Two things I want you to notice here, when I wrote Matt and when I wrote Cam, I used all capital letters. That's because in your descriptive text, which is all standard lowercase, the first time you ever mention a character, you put their name in all capital letters, only the first time that they are mentioned in descriptive text. So what happens next? Whether I take this marker and I chuck it at Cam, or whether someone says something, we have a beat now. This is kind of the first thing that happens. So we automatically have a space. Let's get some dialogue going. So let's say I am going to say something to Cam. So the first thing you need for the format, you need to say the name of the person who is speaking first. And that is tabbed over five times. So there's this button on your keyboard, it says tab on it. Every time you hit that, it's uh, by default, it's set up to make 10 spaces. So we're gonna hit that key. I'm gonna write this down almost like code. So tab, I've got it in the brackets here. Tab, 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 tab. And the name of this character who's doing the speaking is all capital letters. Now, some of you might be saying, wait a minute, you just said Matt is only all capital letters the first time. Yes, in descriptive text, the first time you see Matt, it's all capital letters. But anytime there's dialogue, this is a whole new section here. Anytime there's dialogue, the person who's speaking always, their name is in all capital letters. So what does Matt say, whenever you have someone speaking, their actual dialogue is tabbed over two tabs. What is Matt going to say? Maybe Matt says, what are you looking at? All right, if this is all Matt says, you automatically have a space. So let's say Cam is going to reply. So first we have to have Cam's name and it is tabbed over five times. And again, a lot of times when people look at screenplays, they assume, oh, this is just all centered, right? It's not centered. This is tabbed over five times. Tab, 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 tab. Tab. All capital letters, Cam. Now, before we say what Cam says, a lot of times you'll notice in screenplays, they have right underneath where the person uh, says their dialogue, there will be some descriptive words in parentheses. That's called a parenthetical. And that's just describing how they are going to deliver this dialogue. Now, this is very important because let's face it, there's a huge difference between a character saying, hey, do you want to go to the store? Or a character saying, hey, do you want to go to the store? Or a character saying, hey, do you want to go to the store? Or a character saying, hey, do you want to go to the store? So how an actor delivers their dialogue is very, very important. So let's say Cam is about to say something sarcastic. So in that case, parentheticals are always underneath and they're tabbed over four tabs. Tab, 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 tab. And so Cam is going to say something in parentheses, all lowercase, sarcastic, alley, end of parentheses. Now we can actually have his dialogue. Dialogue is two tabs over. Tab, tab. And Cam is going to say sarcastically, your fly is undone jackhole. <laughs> jackhole is one of those perfect words where like 
if you want to call someone a name but you don't really want to use profanity there's been so many situations where like i just bite my tongue and then five minutes later i'm like oh, jack hole jack hole would have been perfect so your fly is undone jack hole now if this is all cam says we automatically have a space i'm out of room so we're going to be on the next page what happens next uh, do I say something? Does something happen? Does it go to a new scene? Let's say something's gonna happen. So now we move back to descriptive text like this. We now notice a young man, comma, James, comma, holding a video camera, comma, who begins laughing uncontrollably. Huh. We now notice, <laughs> we now notice a young man, James, holding a video camera who begins laughing uncontrollably. If this is all that happens here, what happens next? Maybe now, that's kind of a beat, right? A single tear rolls down Matt's cheek. Now notice, when I wrote Matt here, I didn't write it all capital letters. That's because in descriptive text, we only have all capitals the first time Matt is mentioned. After that, Matt is standard lowercase. So obviously the first letter is capitalized, but uh, the rest is lowercase. What happens next? So let's do a voiceover. So a voiceover, as you guys probably know from your terminology, a voiceover is the voice of an unseen narrator. So it could be someone who is describing like uh, someone who's narrating the story, like in a world where thing, you know, that kind of thing. Or it could be a voice in someone's head where you can actually hear what they are thinking. So let's say that we are going to hear what Matt is thinking. In that case, we automatically have a space separating this. Now, voiceovers are written very similar to how you set up the format for your dialogue. So first thing we do, we tab over five times, tab. Tab, Mellow Yellow, Surge, Pepsi Free. Now the person giving the voiceover is Matt, so this is all capital letters. Now, before we hit the return or enter key, because this is a voiceover, immediately after Matt, you have a space, but then in parentheses, you have capital V dot, capital O dot, end parentheses. So some of you might be saying, wait, hold on a second. Parentheses are supposed to be underneath and tabbed over four times. That is true if it's describing how the dialogue is being delivered. But if it's a voiceover, that would actually be next to the name like this. We could actually have another, in fact, let's do it. We can actually have another parenthetical under here. So not only is it a voiceover, but we're gonna describe the way that this voiceover is being delivered. So in order to do that, we tab over four times. Tab, 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 tab. In a script, uh, is a voiceover similar to a wild track? No. So what a wild track is, a wild track is just when you're on set and you are recording a voice that is going to be used separately. Ideally, that would be used as a voiceover, but it could be, there's a number of things that a wild track could be. A wild track could be fixing the audio for, for something else that's going to get placed over. A wild track could also be something that is seen off screen. So it's something that's there, but you just don't see it on camera. So it's not necessarily a voiceover. A lot of times it probably would be, but not necessarily. And in some cases, for example, when we were filming Aladdin 3477, we had a couple characters that wore helmets, like Lochan Shyamal, for example. And we actually did, at times, we would actually mic up the voice, who's Brian Dalling, who plays the character. There were times where we would put a mic inside the helmet, 
but it just made it easier and we just got better sound. It was just a lot easier to work with if we recorded wild tracks of Brian talking separately so that we didn't have to deal with that and worry about any kind of muffling or you know whatever. We wanted to kind of control exactly how that voice sounded later. Uh, that's a great question. So here we go, we're gonna have a parenthetical. The way we're gonna hear this in Matt's head, it's a voiceover, but the way we're gonna hear this, it's gonna sound like Matt is whimpering. So we're gonna write whimpering in parentheses. This is standard lowercase. What are we gonna hear Matt say? This is tabbed over two times. Tab, tab. And maybe we hear the voice in Matt's head say, why does everyone hate me? I wish I lived on the moon. Now, let's say after this, not only did we just hear what Matt is saying, let's say we are going to see what Matt Bush is thinking. We're actually going to see it. So this would actually be a new scene because we would need to create a new set for this. Let's say we're going to visualize Matt actually living on the moon. I know this is a ridiculous story, but this is going to help show you guys exactly how to do format. What we're going to do, we automatically have a space here. Next up, we're going to have a transition and transitions are things that kind of happen in between scenes. Uh, transitions are things like wipe and dissolve, fades, but also cut is the one that you have the most. You normally don't write that you're having a cut, but I'm actually going to show you guys why and I'm going to show you an example of where you actually would write cut to. What we're going to do now, let's say we're actually going to dissolve into the next scene because we're kind of in Matt's living room. I'm describing myself as if I'm in the third person, but right now we're in my living room and let's say we're gonna transition into my mind and what I'm thinking. So a lot of times you would use a dissolve for that. So it's kind of like moving footage replaced by more moving footage. When you have any kind of transition, your transitions are always all capital letters and they are always flush right. We've got our space here. And then flush right in all capital letters, dissolve to colon. Then after that, you have another space. So whenever you have a transition, it really eats up a lot of room because it's almost like three spaces just so you can say dissolve to. Now, this is already a new scene, so we have our slug line. If this takes place on the moon, we are exterior. We're outside. Space dash space. Where are we? Moon. Where are we specifically? Well, there's not really a lot of places on the moon, so I'm gonna say... Sea of Tranquility. Sea of Tranquility, all right. Cratery surface is what I'm gonna say. And if we can see things, is it daytime or nighttime? Space dash space. It will be daytime. I'm gonna say daytime. If it's nighttime, it would really be dark. Although daytime, I'm sure, you know, it would be really uh, bright as well, but let's just say daytime. All right, we automatically have a space separating the slug line from our descriptive text. And what do we see? Donning a silly space suit, comma. We now see Matt, again, standard lowercase, bouncing along the dusty terrain. And that is how you write a screenplay. That's all the juice you need. Now, I mentioned cut. I wanna talk about that real quick. Anytime you have a transition, it's all uppercase and it's always flush right. The only one you rarely ever want to write down is cut because you basically cut from every shot and you normally cut from scene to scene. So you don't really need to write cut. If you don't write anything, it's just automatically assumed you're gonna cut anyway. If you start writing cut every time you think there's a cut, your entire script is gonna be cut to, cut to, cut to, cut to, cut to, and you're just like, for no reason at all, you're just kind of wasting people's time. So you don't need to write cut to, but there is one reason why you would write cut to, and in order to demonstrate that, I need to tell you about the scariest thing I ever saw as a young boy.
So I was, I don't know how old I was, maybe five years old, I'm not sure. But on Saturdays, there was this thing that they would play in the afternoon called Creature Feature. And they would play these old school movies from like the 50s and 60s, the horror movies. But again, they're edited for television. They're on in the afternoon. Now my parents didn't want me watching these movies, but occasionally my parents would be out, I don't know, shopping or visiting friends doing something and I would be home alone no big deal but on a Saturday afternoon sometimes I would realize oh my gosh Creature Feature is on I'm gonna watch it so I remember this one particular day I turn on Creature Feature and it's a black and white movie so even for me I'm like ah oh, this isn't it's an old movie like this isn't really gonna be that scary now when I turned this on I didn't know where I was in the movie like is this at the beginning of the movie the middle of the movie I wasn't really paying attention to what time it was so I turn this on, there's this young woman, she's like maybe her early 20s. She's kind of led into this bedroom by this older woman, and I kind of get the sense, I don't really know what a bed and breakfast is, but it kind of seems like it's a bed and breakfast kind of scenario. And this older woman says, hey, here's, you know, here's the room you'll be staying in. There's, here's a bookshelf, you know, full of all kinds of books that you can read, and here's this comfy bed, and, uh, and there's a chair, you know, right over here. Uh, so make yourself, at, now Cam was not sitting in this room, you know, make yourself at home and if you need anything, I'll be in the front room. So this young woman says, okay, thank you so much. So this older woman leaves, shuts the door. So this younger woman kind of sits on the bed like, oh, nice and comfy, but she can't wait to check out the entertainment system of back in the day. It's this giant bookshelf full of books and she can't wait Oh my gosh, to check these out. So she goes and looks. Now all these books look really, really scary because they're kind of like all bound in leather and they look like they might have spells and they're just like these old tomes that are dusty and, and everything. So she's kind of looking through. She pulls out this one book and there on the cover, there's like a skull. It's like a brass skull and it's like, it's like emblazoned right on the cover. Now I'm already, as a young child, I'm like, Ooh, maybe you don't want to read that one. What does she do? She goes, hmm, fascinating, right? So she goes over and she goes to sit in this rocking chair, right? And she sits down reading, the, like flipping through the pages of this book. We start seeing what's on the pages and it looks really dark and kind of demonic. And it looks like, I don't know if you know what the Necronomicon is from the Evil Dead movies, but like... There's just lots of like illustrated pictures of witches that are burned at the stake and it looks like different potions that would make magical powers and like looks like some pages might be written in blood or something like that. Again, this has been old like cheesy movie from like the 50s, but to me as a young kid, I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, you should put that book away now, right? But instead she's like, this is amazing, right? As she's turning the pages, but then she hears it. She's like, what is that noise? And it almost sounds like chanting, like a bunch of people are all chanting in unison. And you just hear it faintly. She sets the book down. She's like, where is that coming from? I don't, so she walks over to the bookshelf and you know, she kind of gives a listen. No, it's, it's not coming from there. She kind of walks around. Well, she looks and like, you know, right next to the bed, there's this giant throw rug. And she's like, I wonder if so she gets down on the ground, she listens, and it's a little bit louder now. She's like, man, that's really strange. So she, there's a giant throw rug. She kind of moves the rug aside. There's a giant square. It's a hardwood floor, a giant square trap door, and there's this giant ring handle, right? Now at that point, I'm like, oh my gosh, get out of there. But she's like, oh, I wonder if. So she grabs this ring and she's like, ah, and it kind of goes, right? and she pulls this giant trap door up. There's stone steps leading into darkness, but you can hear the chanting echoing in the distance. She kind of looks down and she goes, hello, I know there's people down there. Who are you guys? And I'm like, get out of there. And she goes, well, darn tootin', I'm gonna, she just kind of marches down. So she's walking through and it's, it's all dark and cobwebs and you can barely see anything, but it's like these, 
these stone corridors, and she kind of turns one way and turns another way. The chanting's getting a little bit louder, so she's kind of looking through, and then she sees it up ahead in the distance, way down at the end of the corridor. There's like six people, and they've all got these dark hoods on, and the way the light's coming from above, the hoods are covering their faces, so you can't see their eyes, but you can see their mouths, and they're all chanting in unison, slowly walking towards her. So finally, this young woman, like nothing else was scary, but now finally she goes, ah! right? And she turns and runs this way, except guess what? Behind her, down the other end of the corridor, another six people all wearing these dark cloaks, slowly going towards her. Oh my gosh, ah! right? So she kind of turns down this other corridor and makes another turn down this other corridor. She's led into this giant chamber. It's like there's all these stone walls. In the center of this chamber is this giant altar and it's got like chain shackles on it and it looks like there's blood all over like maybe they were sacrificing animals or something like that. Really creepy but she runs into this giant circular room. There's nowhere to go. And as these people start filing in, they kind of file in this large circle kind of around the edge of the room, and they slowly, they get closer and closer, and she kind of gets stuck by the altar. You know, they shackle one arm here, and they shackle one arm here, and one leg here, and one leg here. She's screaming bloody murder. They're all chanting. It's getting a little bit faster now, the, the chanting, but now there's a new voice in the mix, and you hear this low voice going, that's when the camera pans over to the door where they walked in. Here comes this guy. He's this really big guy. He's got a cloak on too, but he's got like these antlers coming out of his head, this kind of headdress thing. He walks in. He's got this giant knife going. Now, when I call this thing a knife, it's like a sword. It's so big. It's got so many curvy, like weird, like shapes to it. It looks like if you stab someone with this, it's going to hurt really bad, but it's got so many curvy things that it looks like, oh my gosh, it'll hurt going in. It'll hurt even more when you pull it out because it's all these hook shapes. So he walks over. And he's kind of standing, she's screaming bloody murder. He slowly pulls up this, if you can call it a knife, he pulls up this sword. And there's a close up of the hand holding the sword like this. And then right at the moment that the hand goes down like that, it cuts to another shot of another young woman's hand holding a butcher knife and it goes right into a birthday cake. And she cuts back, we pull back to reveal, it's a birthday party and it's in like a New York high rise apartment. Everyone's going, hey, happy birthday. And confetti's going everywhere and she's cutting her birthday cake. And a young Matt Bush stood there like this, looked down and said, I just peed my pants. So it was the scariest thing I ever saw as a young child. Probably the scariest thing I've ever seen ever. Here's the reason I'm sharing this story with you. If you were writing this in a screenplay, you would probably end your scene with, we have a close up of the Grandmaster Warlock as he raises his hand and right at the moment that he thrusts down, then you would say, cut to, then you would have a new scene, interior, New York City high rise apartment, evening, and then maybe the first thing you would say is, thwack! We have a close up of a young woman's hand holding a butcher knife as she cuts her birthday cake. We pull back to reveal it's a big birthday party. Everyone's happy, yay. And six year old boys all across America are peeing their pants. Now that would be a reason that you would want to put cut to because it's very important that at that moment we cut to something else. In this case, it's actually what we call a match cut. So you could say uh, not just cut to, but match cut to. Sometimes you also have a match dissolve where sometimes you'll have a scene that ends where you see the moon in the sky and then it kind of dissolves into something where exactly where the moon was, you see the wheel of a tire moving or something like that. So you'll see really cool transitions like that from time to time. But in this case, it's either a smash cut or it could be a match cut if it's exactly the same the way the knife was coming down. Um, and it's very effective because when it happens that quick, I mean, it really felt like the knife was going into uh, the young woman when really uh, we just saw a knife going into a birthday cake. So that is what's up with format. That is how you are going to write 
your screenplay. Now, in the next video, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about creativity, some things you can do to spruce up your script, some of the basic do's and don'ts. So come back with me next time or something.